I've got to mention to you, my name is Ali Burston, I'm an org psych, um, I do a bit of work with Justine as well. Um, as an org psych, we do a lot of work in the culture <coughs> space, um, some psychometric testing, the wellness space, leadership development, corporate mentoring, executive coaching, that's what org psychs do. So we really uh, look at sort of, you know, psychology in the workplace, if you like. So that's a bit about us and what we do as all. So first thing um, I'd like to speak about in terms of health and wellness is... <coughs> From my perspective, when I first started studying health and wellness a very long time ago and then started implementing a lot of research, the general consensus on health and wellbeing programs is that it's a nice thing to have, right? It's a nice thing, you know, it makes everybody feel happy and, you know, we satisfy a few people that have sent us emails to say, can we have yoga next week? No worries, I'll pick up the phone and organise a few yoga sessions, that's fine. Or we'll get, uh, what did I hear one last week? They organised for a hypnotist. To, uh, no disrespect to hypnotists here, um, if there are any. But yeah, there's someone who put their hand up and said, I want a hypnotist. I said, no worries, we'll put a hypnotist on a flight up to Paribadou. We'll spend a day up there and do some hypnosis on everybody. And that makes that, everybody, that make everybody feel happy. That's what health and wellbeing is all about. That's what we think it's all about, right? Absolutely not. I'm about to turn all of that on its head. So everything that you've thought about health and wellbeing to this point, I'm going to show you in the next 20, 25 minutes Health and wellbeing programs can make a significant difference to your bottom line and your return on investment. All right? Before I start, first thing, just a definition on health. So, our World Health Organization um, defines health as a state of complete physical and social wellbeing and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And from a wellbeing perspective, again, the World Health Organization there states that wellbeing is a state of mental health where every individual realises his or her own potential, can cope with normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. All right? So we'll get that out of the way. So, first things first, what's our business case? So, what is the health of Australians costing government and business enterprise? Total health expenditure in 2013-2014 is $154.6 billion which is up by 3% from 2012 to 2013. Per person expenditure is $6,639, which is up probably just under 100 bucks um, in 2012-2013. Total health expenditure was almost 10% of GDP last year. This is all uh, ABS stats, most recent ABS stats. 25% of taxation revenue is spent on health. It's not defence, not education, Change. That's just purely on health. And lastly, presenteeism, which I'm not sure if many of you know what presenteeism is, but that's actually someone coming to work feeling unwell, okay, and not actually performing very well at work on that particular day. They should probably be at home in bed, okay, but they've turned up to work. And that's costing us $34 billion a year in lost productivity. Okay? So, where is $154 billion spent per year in health? First thing, cancer, cardiovascular disease, mental and substance abuse disorders, musculoskeletal disorders, and injury <coughs> contributed to the, to the most to the economic burden of disease in Australia in 2011. Okay? Cardiovascular disease, 18%, mental health conditions, 18%, were the most commonly reported um, of the selected chronic diseases followed by back pain and problems, which was about 16, 15, 16 percent there. Around 45 percent of Australians aged 16 to 85, so a huge age bracket, will experience a common mental disorder such as depression, anxiety, um, or a substance use disorder in their lifetime. So almost one in two in this room will experience some, some of that, those particular disorders. <coughs> in 2014 and 2015, almost half, so 45 percent of adults aged 6, 18 to 16, were inactive or insufficiently active for health benefits, which was similar to the proportion in 2011 and 2012. We're doing something wrong. Okay? We're doing something wrong. 35% of Australians report having a significant level of distress in their lives. That's up significantly. 26% uh, of Australians report having moderate to extremely severe levels of depression and anxiety. That's one in four. Okay? That number is only getting worse. We're doing something wrong. We're not doing, this is not right. 
26% of Australians report above normal levels of anxiety symptoms, and in 2015, anxiety symptoms were the highest they have been since 2011 when the Australian Psychological Society National Stress and Health with Wellbeing Survey commenced. Right? So what we're looking at there is we're drawing a picture on what the business case is for us to start investing in health and wellbeing in the workplace. Okay? Given we spend the majority of our time, okay, probably eight to 10 hours a day in the workplace, it makes sense for it to be an avenue for, for workplace and, and health and wellbeing. Okay? I've got some good news for you though. It's not all bad news, all right? Don't everyone jump off outside. So, the daily smoking rate is down to an all-time low of 13%. Okay, and in 1989, it was 26%. So we've got a great big tick there, that's great. We're now living longer, which is fantastic. So about 84 years for a female and about 80 years for a male. Between 2003 and 2013, death rates have continued to fall. So 15% for female and 20% for male. Cancer survival is increasing. So again, that's probably a lot down to research, I think. So the mortality rate has fallen by 22% per 100,000 population since 1982. It's great news, because I'm sh pretty certain that our population has, come, has increased. And our visits to the dentist are becoming more regular. Okay? So we've got some good news there too. It's not all bad news. So, looking at health and wellbeing in the workplace. So, one of the most common reasons organisations implement health and wellbeing programs is to reduce absenteeism costs. Okay. Somewhere where there's got to be a business case here where it adds up for us to spend money in something so we're going to get some money back. Okay. Health and wellbeing programs aim to actively encourage employees to participate in fitness, education and wellbeing initiatives in an effort to reduce workplace related illnesses as a byproduct, um, also improve job satisfaction, or commitment and enhanced culture. Okay. So we've got a whole, instead of it just health and wellbeing just sort of sitting here in itself, it actually has a lot of other byproducts that I'll talk to you about this morning in terms of not just implementing health and wellbeing in its singular, singular self, but there are a number of other different factors within the organisation that health and wellbeing programs can also assist in. And today, and certainly in Australia, less than 50% of organisations promote health and wellbeing. Given that many employees spend the majority of their working hours in the workplace, it definitely makes sense for it to be a, a, health, a venue for health investment. Okay. Health and wellbeing program initiatives aim to both educate and promote um, initiatives which include pursuing work alignment and work life alignment for employees to aid in work related stress illnesses, which we talked a lot about this morning. And workplace stress is considered a leading contributor to illness, anxiety, and depression. Right. So, you know, we've obviously had a bit of a chat this morning about bullying and some, obviously have some other workplace related stresses and how we work through those particular frameworks. So we know that that's out there, okay? What I'm saying to you now is that we can include some of those factors within a, a, within a wellbeing program, a health and wellbeing program, we can tick some of those boxes. It's just another added benefit, right? So, the importance of addressing health and wellbeing in the workplace. I've got a few factors here for you. Um, so the first one I can list there for you is reduced absenteeism. So effectively, a healthier workforce has less sick days. Okay. Um, and so those that participate in health and wellbeing programs, we've done considerable research on this, um, are less likely to take a sick day okay. um, than those who don't. We also have less presenteeism too okay, when we have health and wellbeing programs set up. So, enhanced job satisfaction is another one, all right? Now, enhanced job satisfaction is a byproduct of having a health and wellbeing program set up in your workplace, okay? And the reason for that is it's effectively, there is a positive relationship between job satisfaction, employee physical and mental health, okay? So the onus comes down to what we call in all psychology, perceived organizational support, okay? So if I have the perception that my organisation cares about me, okay? my organisation cares about me, my organisation has a health and wellbeing program that is you know, tailored to this workplace, this culture this year, okay? my organisation cares about me, I don't mind staying back 15, 20 minutes, half an hour to finish off something, I don't mind working that little bit harder because my organisation cares about me. It's a reciprocal culture perspective that we take, and that's called perceived organisational support, <coughs> pardon me, which is effectively the holy grail of culture. Okay? 
we're, what we're trying to do is create perceived org support. Right? So that when we call on our employees um, you know, to do certain tasks, perhaps sometimes above and beyond, they're happy to do that because you know what, my employee cares about me. All right? It's the all commitment tree that we look at as well. So enhanced job satisfaction is a big one um, because it also assists in the socio-emotional needs of employees. Um, the next one I've got is enhanced productivity. Why would people think that enhanced productivity is a good byproduct of having a health and wellbeing program? Anyone got any ideas? Why, why are people going to start working a bit better if they're healthier? They're able to concentrate better. Sorry? Sorry? Did you say? Oh, no, because they're healthier. Because they're healthier, okay. So effectively what we're saying here is that you know, if we have a healthy individual, they're more likely to probably work a bit harder for you, okay? Because they're more productive. They concentrate better, they're getting better sleep. They're, their immune system is working more efficiently than someone who does literally no exercise at all, okay? Or isn't a very healthy individual. Research, it's everywhere, okay? Let's say this. The other thing about enhanced productivity is that um, when employees aren't feeling very well, Okay. either physically or emotionally, um, their productivity declines. Okay? So if I'm not feeling very well from a mental or emotional perspective, my productivity is going to decline because I'm distracted. Okay? And that also affects other areas too in terms of being a safe workplace as well um, and fatigue and things like that. I'm not even going to go into that space in a moment. But also from a physical perspective, if you're not feeling very well, it's sort of a little bit like a presentee is what we were talking about before. Okay, so people aren't going to be performing as well as they can if they're not feeling very well, either emotionally or physically. Okay? But if we've got a health and wellbeing program, we, have, we, we see a number, a number of different studies that suggest that we have enhanced productivity by having health and wellbeing programs. Okay. Um, better staff retention. Why would we have better staff retention if we've got a health and wellbeing program set up? Sorry? Oh, my organisation is kept. Pretty good, pretty good. Seems a good place to work with my state. That's it. Very similar one. Okay, absolutely right. So effectively, my employee cares about me. My employee cares about my health. My employee cares about my wellbeing. My employee cares about the fact that I completed an engagement survey a month ago. I got a feedback email back, right, saying this is the top three or five themes that this particular survey reported on because we're doing a duty of care by reporting back to people on what our feedback is in a survey that we've completed. And then as a result of that, taking that feedback on and saying, okay, well, all right, within our budget, what can we do here? Okay, We've gone out to our workplace. We've gone in, we've had a look at, we've effectively done what we call pulse check surveys. We've gone out and done an engagement survey on what the employees want at that particular point from a health and wellbeing perspective. We've been very strategic in the initiatives that we've suggested, okay, and, and on a side note, your physical fitness initiatives will reap you better rewards, okay, just as a side note. We've been very strategic on what we've asked people of, so we've then gone through, got their feedback, given people a feedback email to say thanks so much for completing the survey, we really value your time, these are the top five themes, we're looking at, from a moving forward perspective, this is what we're looking at doing, here, here and here, okay, all right. Does everybody do that? <laughs> Just kidding, I don't do that all the time, but that's okay. So anyway, so that's what we're looking at here, okay? So what we're doing is when we look at better staff retention, the other really important perspective about that is our fantastic new phenomenon called Gen Y, okay? Now Gen Ys have a very different view on health and wellbeing to what other generations have had in the past, okay? So if we're investing in, in, a, in, in a Gen Y's health and wellbeing, generally speaking, according to our research, Gen Y's feel much better about that. Okay, my employer cares about me, so therefore I'm going to stick around here for a little bit longer. Okay, I don't mind doing I don't mind doing a little bit more after hours, that sort of thing. Okay, because for Gen Y's, those particular factors are important. Okay, the health and wellbeing side for Gen Y's are really important. Um, and we need to start looking at how to address some of those Gen Y factors as well, but that's another, that's another day. All right, so better staff retention is a goodie. Um, 
And I guess from my perspective, to employees who are emotionally committed to their organisation display improved performance, lower absenteeism, and are more likely to stay with the organisation. Right. And last one, greater employee engagement. Right. So appealing initiatives promote a healthy culture, foster a culture of wellness, engagement, and delivery on feedback, enhance productivity, people want to. So what I'm getting at there is I'm saying, is if we're going out and into our workplace and doing engagement or pulse check surveys on what people want to see in a health and wellbeing program from a number of different initiatives that we've thought through and we've possibly already got feedback on already in the past. We're going through and delivering on some of those feedback factors, okay, and looking at that and saying, okay, well, you know, people have said they really want uh, personal training sessions down on the foreshore. People want us going in there, we, you know, we're going to have a group in the HBF run for a reason, you know, we're going to have a whole group in that. We're going to have, um, you know, some corporate massage. We've also decided we're going to start replacing some vending machines. Not all of them. We're going to start doing that because what we're trying to do is, is enhance our brand. And, okay? and we're also going to start marketing much more heavily what health and wellbeing is all about. Because effectively, with health and wellbeing programs, we're not necessarily targeting those people who are already health very healthy and physically fit and great and active. We're not necessarily targeting those people. We are targeting those people that don't value health and well-being. Okay? And according to these stats, there's at least thanks, mate. At least according to these stats, there's at least 45% of people in a workplace that don't value that health and well-being and also don't do sufficient enough exercise. Okay? So what we're doing there is we need to sort of work out a strategy on how we engage these people that don't value health and well-being, okay? How do we do that, all right? And in the same respect too, how to create better engagement with our staff, okay? Because engagement helps us with productivity, Jay, so job satisfaction, it helps us with better <coughs> organisation commitment, perceived org support, okay? Health and well-being is just a small little pillar in that whole kettle of fish around how we get better engagement with our staff, okay? Better engagement will lead to, as I said before, better staff retention. Okay? We tick a lot of boxes with health and wellbeing. So, the importance of addressing health and wellbeing in the workplace. Health of senior staff needs safeguarding. Okay? Healthy and happy employees are more productive. Okay? We've got lots of research that would suggest that. When employees aren't feeling well, either physically or emotionally, their productivity declines. And organisations that sponsor and promote health and wellbeing enhance their brand and image. Team cohesiveness is increased with greater communication. So where we've, we've looked at that, so in, a, in the research that we were looking at a number of years ago, the, the intent on the sense of belonging, okay, and the emphasis on people wanting to be in social groups, okay, and so whether that's um, working in a, in a personal training session or doing a lunch and learn on stress management or understanding more about what mindfulness is, the sense of belonging, so us addressing the socio-emotional needs of our staff increases when we do these group sessions. Okay? Now, those group sessions not only help us from, in terms of you know, communication and things like that, but it also helps us develop better relationships too. We can tick a lot of boxes by holding, you know, for example, a PT session down on the foreshore, or something like that, where we've got people engaging with each other, you know, people from different divisions, whatever it is, um, you know, talking about their work, going out into, into the, you know, a nice open space, getting some fresh air, doing some exercise, and then coming back. Okay, so it's not just from a health or a physical perspective that we're looking at there, we're also looking at it from an engagement perspective. And this, as I said, this importance on the sense of belonging. Okay. Especially in a workplace where, and obviously a society, where so much is done on a smartphone, an iPad, a laptop. Okay? Humans, it's, it's a, a basic need, want, desire for humans is the social interaction with others. Okay? So, the employee who is exercising and typically is healthier as a result um, will, likely show up, uh, will likely show up to work with more energy and enhanced positivity. Um, it's been recognised that employees who are emotionally committed to the organisations display um, improved performance, reduced absenteeism, and are more likely to stay with their organisation. Workplace health and wellbeing programs can assist in creating a psychologically healthy and safe workplace. So, this is where we turn health and wellbeing around a little bit. 
healthy employees are going to cost you less because the return on investment is four to one and in some cases six to one. So what I mean by that is for every one dollar you invest in health and well-being you will get between four to six dollars back in absentees and expenditure. Okay? It's not a bad business case from my perspective. Every one dollar you invest in health and well-being, as long as your program's running fairly strategically, it's effective, okay? You've gone out, you've sought engagement from your people and you're implementing what people are asking you of, you will get four dollars back, between four and six dollars back in absentees and costs. All right. Healthy employees cost you less money. All right? Now that's a business case to think about. So wellness programs have often been viewed as a nice extra, not a strategic imperative. All right? The latest research suggests that our ROI on health and wellbeing programs is generally between four to one and six to one. There's some studies out there where it's 15 to one, something like that. They must have a poor engagement before. So case study one. I don't know what those guys are doing. All right, so case study one, I've only got three here to show you. So in 2010, 28,000 uh, employees um, to the global study across 15 different countries found that when health and wellbeing programs are managed correctly, all right, employee engagement increased nearly eight times. Okay, it's 28,000 employees, 15 countries. Further, organisational performance increased two and a half times compared to a rival organisation that didn't manage their health and wellbeing program strategically <coughs> or effectively. And when I talk about strategically or effectively, what I mean, as I said to you before, is about engaging with your staff, having a consistent process, okay? Having probably one or two people that manage health and wellbeing, it's not just sort of an added extra on, on a HR individual, okay? It's not part of that at all, okay? And it's also going through to and doing routine evaluation. So routinely evaluating and testing and looking at saying, okay, so what of these initiatives are working? Running mini surveys after every particular um, you know, initiative that we run, okay? It's, it's about all of those things. That's how we run it strategically and effectively. Okay, study two. So we've got 185 in this particular study. So participants weren't heart patients, but they received cardio, <coughs> cardiac rehabilitation and exercise training from a wellness person. Um, of those classified as high risk when the study started, according to body fat, blood pressure, anxiety and other measures, 57% were converted to low risk status by the end of a six month worksite cardiac rehabilitation and exercise program. Further, medical claim costs had declined by $1,421 per person compared to those from the previous years. All right. And the last case study, number three. Perth-based oil and gas engineering consultancy had an ad hoc and reactive approach to wellness. So effectively what I said when I first started speaking this morning, it was someone rings up or someone sends an email, we please have Pilates next week. Yep, no worries, I'll ring this person up. We'll get Pilates, yeah, we've had you out before, can you come and do eight Pilates sessions? Yep, no worries, charge us $300, okay, done. All right, finished. All right, email back, yep, Pilates sessions, starting next week, 12 to one, come to this room, this is what Pilates, this is what we're doing. Does that sound familiar to anybody in here? That sort of ad hoc reactive approach, okay? This is what this particular organisation had, right? Their average sick days were over 15 days a year, okay? So their absenteeism costs were costing them an enormous amount, all right? Over 15 days a year. The national average is 9.8, okay? So there was something not working right here. They had vending machines packed full of junk in there. Um, they had, as I said, a very ad hoc approach. Normally those people that would ring up for um, a health and wellbeing initiative or something like that were those healthy ones, okay, that would say, okay, well look, you know, can we do PT sessions or can we, can we do the city to surf or something like that? And then they just go and ring up and say, yep, okay, well nice, that's done. All right. Okay, so this sort of ad hoc reactive approach to health and wellbeing, that's exactly where this organisation is at. So after implementing a structured program for just one year, they reduced employee absenteeism by 4.28 hours per person, saving them just over 250k um, in absenteeism expenditure in one year. Now the great thing about health and wellbeing programs is that you'll see a pretty good return on investment in your first year or so, 
but then it gets better, okay? Because your people are getting healthier. That sometimes takes a bit of time, but it's a fundamentally turning it back to value set, okay? And as I said to you before, it's talking to those people who don't necessarily value health and well-being, okay? Who think this is not important for me. They're the ones we want to turn around because we've got a business case of four to one, okay? Even six to one in some cases, all right? They're, they're those particular people we need to engage with. For us to go and approach and do some sort of survey with them and say a focus group possibly even, and say, okay, well look, you know, what sort of an issues would, it, would interest you? Okay, well actually, Ali, I quite like yoga. Okay, that's cool, all right. Well, who else likes yoga? There are, there are quite a few people that like yoga. All right, we can look at turning this around. Okay, so it's those people we need to engage with because healthy employees cost you less. Right, so how do we start to address health and well-being in the, in the workplace? I've got half a dozen things here for you. So, start an engagement process to reliably measure workplace culture in organisational health and wellbeing. So that's one of your first steps, okay? Is as I said to you, get an engagement survey running, okay? Um, be careful that your, your group doesn't know your employees don't have survey fatigue, okay? Because that's not going to help you. You've got to, have to think of something else if they've got survey fatigue. And when I talk about survey fatigue, I mean survey after survey after survey. Oh, what's this one here? Okay, yeah, we're going to tick, 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 tick. Right, that's survey fatigue, all right? So perhaps rebrand it or rebadge it as something else, all right? But what we want to do is we want to get an accurate measure, an accurate pulse check of what's happening in organisational health and wellness. Because that's going to help us create a baseline, right? The next thing you're going to need, senior leadership. And you're going to need their leadership and you're going to need their buy-in. Because that is absolutely critical. A few others this morning have talked about leadership being a top-down process. It's exactly the same in health and wellbeing. If you present a business case, okay, happy to give you all the research that you need. Okay? Present a business case that says health and wellbeing programs are going to save this organisation X amount of dollars with a return on investment, four to one, even six to one. You know, that is hopefully going to turn it around for those people in those senior leadership positions. They're going to help drive your organisational health and wellbeing programs. Because the buy-in that you get from them at this level is going to significantly help you for those, you know, effectively the rest of us and the rest of the organisation because having a senior GM or having a director or someone like that heading down to the foreshore and doing a personal training session with the rest of his team or, I don't know, 20 or 30 other people is showing the rest of the organisation from a cultural perspective that this is a good thing to do, okay? We, we believe in this. And even more, job satisfaction increases. My employer cares about me. Job retention, okay? We need visible leadership, we need supervisors to help us, so super, perceived supervisor support as well is also very important. So when we're busy and under the pump, we need supervisors to understand and say, okay, well look, I know you're under the pump, take an hour out, go to this class, you know, go and do a lunch and learn on stress management or mindfulness or healthy eating, something like that, because it's, it's important to this organisation, we're living those values through that supervisor, that supervisor level, okay? Um, Create an accurate baseline so you can measure return on investment improvements. Must have valid absentees and data. All right, so what I'm talking about there is this particular organisation that we were working with in that case study three. <laughs> they had their absentees and data was, was okay. They'd never, you know, they, they looked at absenteeism on the whole, but sort of halfway through what we were doing, they came up with this idea of thinking that, which I'm glad we sort of asked them not to, but. <laughs> They come up with this idea of uh, putting carers leave with absentees and leave, okay? So when you go do your timesheet, um, you would tick carers leave as absentees and leave as well. And absentees and leave and carers leave are all sort of combined in one, okay? So that's, that's not helpful, all right? So what we're looking at there is make sure you've got you know, really good, accurate absentees and data so that people are actually recording sick days so you can look at that and get a baseline and say, okay, well, look, you know what? We're spending 450 grand a year on absentees and costs, all right? We go spend 50 grand on a health and wellbeing program over 12 months. I'm hoping we're gonna get a few dollars back after that, okay? And then we just keep enhancing it, all right? So we keep going through and get the engagement process, okay? And we're smart about the initiatives that we're running, all right? We don't have an ad hoc or reactive approach, all right? Set participation and expenditure KPIs. So what I'm looking at there is going through from a senior leadership perspective and saying we're gonna create a pillar we're creating a wellness pillar, okay? So what that means is when you look at KPIs and expenditure, okay, we're only going to spend 
you know, over a certain amount of employees, this is how much we're going to do, we're going to divvy it up, I don't know how much it is, $500 per employee, whatever it is, over a 12-month period, that's going to be our expenditure budget. But then we're also going to say to our senior leadership team, these are your KPIs. You've currently got 20% participation rates in your team. We want them at 50% by the end of the year. Okay? This is a value set. We've got a business case here that tells us we're going to save a whole lot of money and healthy employees are going to cost me less. This is now a KPI. This is part of the performance management system. Okay? So it can entwine itself in that too. All right? At the same time, we're creating better, healthier employees. We're getting better job satisfaction. We're being more productive. Okay? We're ticking quite a few boxes here by being very strategic and having a completely different view on health and wellbeing. The last two, promote workplace value and health and wellness in the recruitment process, okay? So that sort of goes back to the fact that what we're trying to do there in a HR process is say, we have a really great health and wellbeing program. All right, so we offer subsidised gym memberships, um, you know, we do all these great things um, in terms of, you know, creating a healthy workplace. Come and work with us. Because the likelihood is that you're probably going to attract people who have that very similar value. That's a bonus for you. Okay? So we go and we go and advertise and promote and market that during during our HR process or our recruitment process. Okay? Because that means we're encouraging people who have a similar health and wellbeing mindset <coughs> to us to come and work with us. Yeah? It's also cultural too. And delivery is key. Alright? So the way we're delivering our message around the communication that we have to our people, the way we are, we're branding it, the way we're looking at our image around creating what the value set is and driving that through the rest of the organisation and saying this is, a, this is a value, this is what's in it for you because fundamentally people are all about what's in it for me. What's in it for me? Tell me what's in it for me and then I'll think about it, alright? And then I'll decide if I'm going to do something about it, alright? Well then it's up to us to work out what is actually in it for you and how am I going to badge, badge and rebrand that to ensure it's appealing and our initiatives are easy and convenient to attend, okay? That's how we work out what's in it for them. Because we've got a better way of turning that around. We can work out what's in it for that particular person. Yeah. We can communicate better as well. So, in summary, total health expenditure is $154 billion a year, up by 3% since 2012-2013. One of the most common reasons organisations implement health and wellbeing programs is to reduce absenteeism expenditure. Given that many employees spend the majority of their working hours in the workplace, it makes sense for it to be a, a venue for health investment. Health and wellbeing program initiatives aim to both educate and promote initiatives, which include pursuing work-life alignment for employees to aid in work-related stress illnesses. Research suggests that return on investment on health and wellbeing programs is generally four to one, six to one. And lastly, workplace health and wellbeing programs can assist in creating a psychologically healthy and safe workplace. And the organisational advantages of implementing health and wellbeing programs are reduced absenteeism, enhanced job satisfaction, enhanced productivity, better staff retention, and greater employee engagement. Thank you for having me. Good morning.